What is going on everybody out there? My name is Jake James Lugo. Welcome to the channel and welcome to this brand new JJ's One Man Podcast. So there's a lot to talk about lately over the last like week, week and a half. So many things have been happening within the world of gaming, within the world of movies, pop culture, entertainment, social media. It's been a wild like seven to 10 days. Let me put it that way. But regardless though, before we get into everything else that we're going to talk about, because there's a lot to really discuss, make sure that you guys leave a like on this video. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel too for more podcast episodes, more gameplay videos. There's been a lot that's been going up on the channel lately and everything else on top of that. And don't forget to leave a comment down below. Tell me your thoughts about everything we're going to talk about in this podcast. Talk to me about some of the game releases that have been coming out. Again, we got Battlefront Classic Collection, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Rise of the Ronin is right around the corner. Like, there's a, again, there's just so many things going on. Then movies. Don't even get me started on movies because, again, I just saw Poor Things recently. We have Ghostbusters coming out next week. And again, the list goes on and on and on. But make sure you guys do that for me. Show some love to the channel. Help out the podcast. And we can keep doing some good things out here on the channel. But we got a lot to talk about. So let's start off with the first things first. This trailer for the crow that recently came out so if you don't know anything about the crow remake or the reboot or whatever you want to call it uh bill skarsgård is starring as the main actor in the crow reboot they have their first trailer as you guys can see here i'm not going to watch the trailer because obviously of youtube copyright and everything else but basically the trailer came out i watched the trailer okay it's about Eric Draven. Yeah, Eric Draven. Yeah, I think that Bill Skarsgård is playing the same person. So it's pretty much redoing the story from the original 1994 film, but it's based on a graphic novel, which, funny enough, I should say uh, about that, I actually, when I first heard about The Crow, I only heard about it from the movie with Brandon Lee, the original movie from 1994. I didn't know that it was based on a graphic novel for a long time until I saw someone reporting about it, which is not that big of a deal, but... <clears throat> If you know anything about The Crow, you know how like dark and gritty it could get. But on top of that, also, the other thing that's interesting about The Crow is that it really in influenced a lot of the goth, goth, goth culture. <laughs> Say that five times fast. It really influenced the goth culture of the mid to late 90s for many different reasons. The whole style, the aesthetic, everything else about it really came from that movie, or at least was kind of edged on from that movie, and it kind of like branched off its other things. But look, this is the first look that we originally got of Bill Skarsgård as Eric Draven from The Crow. I didn't like it. I came out and said that he looks like Jared Leto. Many people said the same thing. The trailer really didn't change up my overall uh, just view and my outlook on the on the on just the, the reboot as a whole. Like it just wasn't something that I felt like really, really changed up anything that really kind of like changed my mind or got me more excited for this movie because... Granted, the trailer did show that there is going to be a lot of action. There's going to be a lot of grit. It's going to be very kind of like bold and in your face with not only a lot of the kills, but also a lot of the other like fights and everything else that's going on, as well as the subject matter. I mean, Eric Draven in this version, from my understanding, he meets his wife within, I believe it's a rehab facility. At least that's what I got from the trailer. And they show the, like the beginnings of their love story and then everything else before he gets the power of the crow. And... If you're into this story, if you're into the original source material, I know a lot of people that I've seen that have been big fans of the original movie are not feeling this, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to watch it, you know, whenever it comes out in theaters. I think that, you know, this this movie's going to have a lot of chatter behind it between a lot of people. It's just, again, on first impression for me, I'm not feeling it. I don't think that it looks like trash. I just don't think it's going to work. I feel very indifferent about the Crow reboot. And I'm hoping that when I eventually do see the movie, because it's coming out later this year, I believe it's in June. I think that's what it says. Let me double check that whenever this movie's coming out. I believe it's in June. But whenever it comes out, I'm going to watch it. Yeah, it's June 7th is when it's dropping this year, 2024. So I'm going to watch it. Hopefully, at least I, I get a better opinion of it, you know, when I finally see the full movie. But let me know your thoughts about the Crow reboot. Have you had a chance to see the trailer yet? Did you have any sort of opinion about Bill Skarsgård as Eric Draven, as the Crow, at least from the images and what we saw in the trailer? Talk to me about that stuff down below in the comments section. <coughs> wrong pipe. Over here drinking coffee and went down the wrong pipe. So, moving on from there, okay? Because we got to talk about, of course, we have to talk about what's going on with Star Wars right now. Because you guys know I love Star Wars You've, if you've been following the podcast, you've been following the channel, you know I love Star Wars. So we have to talk about this Patty Jenkins stuff. <clears throat> this Patty Jenkins stuff hey, is a little bit weird, right? This is the same thing that I felt with what was going on with Gal Gadot or Gal Gadot over on, uh, what is it? 
uh, with the Wonder Woman 3 stuff and everything else. It was just a weird thing going on with DC. And this is the same thing that I feel what's going on with Patty Jenkins. Now, I do have to say this, okay, with the caveat of some extra information that came out yesterday about all this stuff. Because when some of these stories were written, they didn't have the extra context or the extra info from certain sources. Now, the one that I actually follow a lot that has a lot of good info and a lot of good sources when it comes to the movie stuff, and especially the business of movies, is uh, Jeff Schneider, okay? Jeff Schneider, <coughs> he reports on a ton of stuff, right? He reports on a ton of things overall in movies. And one of the things that he's been talking about for a long time is Patty Jenkins and Rogue Squadron, uh, as well as also Patty Jenkins' other projects. Now, according to him, when he was asked about this by John Roke on their, uh, was it their, uh, their podcast that they do, he said that this movie is more than likely not happening. Obviously, it says here in Variety that Patty Jenkins has to write a script. She has to give a script over to Lucasfilm. That makes sense. She was commissioned or contracted to do that. But I still believe, okay, overall, I don't think this movie's happening, okay? I don't think this movie is going down. At least a Rogue Squadron movie directed by Patty Jenkins. I feel like with Rogue Squadron in general, I feel like we're eventually going to get a Rogue Squadron movie, but I don't think we're getting it anytime soon. Not only because of what Jeff Schneider was saying, <coughs> damn, I'm coughing so much, it's like going down the wrong pipe. Not only from what Jeff Schneider was saying, but also specifically because of what Lucasfilm has been doing over the last couple months. The funny thing is, right? The funny thing is, let me show you the, the, the actual article again. The funny thing is, is that not that long ago, we heard stories and we heard statements from Bob Iger and a few other people over at Disney that things were winding down. They were kind of like dialing stuff back with the number of projects that they were outputting, both at places like Lucasfilm and Marvel at Disney specifically. There's been a lot of stuff that's been shifting with Disney overall. Now, keep in mind, with Lucasfilm, we still have projects that are down the pipeline. We got the Mandalorian and Grogu movie that originally was supposed to be Mandalorian Season 4, which is still unclear whether Season 4 is still happening, but we're getting this Mandalorian and Grogu movie. We're getting the Dawn of the Jedi movie with David Lindelof, I believe it is. Yeah, I believe it's David Lindelof. I'm not sure. I could be wrong on that, but we're getting that Dawn of the Jedi movie. We're getting the Rey movie, the new Jedi Order movie that's still coming. That's going to be after the Mandalorian and Grogu. And keep in mind, that's not even counting also the big uh, ensemble movie that Dave Filoni is doing that's going to bring all the Mandalorian shows together. That's four projects right there. Do you really think after all that stuff that's been shifting around that they're going to add on Rogue Squadron on top of that for five movies? Like real talk. And keep in mind, all this is coming from Patty Jenkins. She's the one that actually went on this podcast. Let me see if I can find the exact quote. Okay. When I left Star Wars to do Wonder Woman 3 and I started working on that, we talked about, well, maybe I'll come back to Star Wars after Wonder Woman 3. So we started a deal for that to happen. Uh, when Wonder Woman 3 then went away, Lucasfilm and I were like, oh, we've got to, to finish this deal. We finished the deal right as the strike is, was beginning. So I now owe a draft for Star Wars. So we will see what happens there. Who knows? That's the thing. Okay, this is just coming from her saying that, okay, she had a deal, okay, to write a Star Wars thing or to be involved with a Star Wars project, which was Rogue Squadron. However, we haven't heard anything from Lucasfilm officially. There's been no statement since this come out. All the trades that have written about it have not really gotten a quote from Lucasfilm. And again, based on all the stuff that Lucasfilm and Bob Iger has said up to this point now, I still don't think this movie's happening. She might still be contracted to write this script or to turn in a draft and all this other stuff, and she's going to get paid for that. But that still doesn't mean that this movie's happening. That's what Jeff Schneider was saying. He was say, basically coming out and saying, like, look, this movie is just straight up still not happening. It's not going to go down because of all this other stuff that's been shifting around ever since the pandemic happened. And real talk, I want a Rogue Squadron movie. I've been dying to see this. I was actually interested in the one that Patty Jenkins was going to make based on what she was saying as far as, you know, having her dad be a fighter pilot. I think that element of like, you know, personal kind of like connection to that type of stuff being injected to a Rogue Squadron movie, or at least in that setting, could have been interesting. But with everything else that's going on with Lucasfilm right now, I just don't think this movie's happening. I think that as much as Patty Jenkins can say that she's doing something or that she wants to do it, that doesn't make it a reality. And... Granted, Lucasfilm hasn't been the best as of lately being really clear and just being really direct on what exactly is going down with Star Wars. I don't think they've really gotten a good handling on everything that's going on right now, but we'll see what happens in the next few months because I still don't foresee them announcing that that movie's still coming back. It just is weird because we've gone through this stuff before with Lucasfilm. We had this with her film, with the Rogue Squadron. We had this 
with the the uh, the original. I think it's the David Lindelof or no, the original uh, Ray film that originally was supposed to be like about older Ray. We had all this other stuff. We had the 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 Donald Glover Lando movie, which we still don't know what's going on. They did say that he was writing that movie with his brother, but it's like we haven't heard anything since, and it's been God knows how long now at this point. And with all those other movies that they were really quick to kind of announce and really put out there on top of, again, I even forgot right now because we still have to mention this because it's Lucasfilm, the Disney Plus shows that are going on. We got The Acolyte coming out. We got Skeleton Crew. We got, uh, what is it? Tales of the Jedi. There's all this other stuff going on. And or season two, which is still coming around the corner. It's, you know, they got a lot on their plate and I feel like just adding more of this stuff is not going to help. And it's contradictory to all the statements that have come out beforehand, but regardless though those are my thoughts about all this stuff let me know some of your thoughts about what's going on with lucasfilm down below in the comment section do you think we're going to get this rogue squadron movie do you think it's going to be directed by patty jenkins or do you think this is all just posturing do you think like this movie's not going to happen because i'm in the later camp i really don't think it's going to go down but tell me your thoughts about that down below in the comments so moving on from there speaking of star wars okay because we have to talk about this not that long ago okay as of this week we had a release of Star Wars Battlefront, the classic collection. Now, many of you know I've been excited about this. I've been hyped up. I've been dying to play this. I finally got my hands on it thanks to Aspire. They actually sent me a code for the PlayStation 5 version. Started playing it that day, and it was right before release, and then I started playing after release as well. So ever since this game came out, has been massive issues for a lot of people. Number one, there's been a lot of bugs and glitches across different platforms, but mostly on PC. I haven't ran into a lot of bugs and glitches myself on PS5, but I've seen a lot of the stuff that's been shared around. On top of that, the online component, okay, the online multiplayer has been a mess. Okay, Aspire was not prepared for the amount of people that were going to jump on this game, the amount of people that wanted to play this at launch, especially for the 64-player matches. There was only three servers that were available across every platform to play 64-player matches, which is pretty bad when you really think about it because it was just so downplaying the amount of people that were interested in this game, and a lot of people were upset. On top of that, too, some of the biggest things, okay, that also came from that as well. There was a lot of stuff with the update that I even noted on Twitter. If you haven't seen it, go on my Twitter page and you'll see the tweet that I put out about the update that came out. They changed up the splash page, but within that update, they also changed up the, the sound for the original Battlefront with the loading screen. Because when I first started playing it, I had it where it was the sound you're supposed to get from the console version. But then after the update, it changed up to like be really weird. And there was all this stuff that was all over the place. So the thing that we want to talk about is this statement from Aspire, okay? This comes from Aspire Media. They actually posted this up yesterday on their official blog, and they shared it on their Twitter and all their other social media. They come out and go. It comes from uh, Joe at Aspire. We'd like to thank the Battlefront community for their overwhelming support and feedback of the, the Classic Collection. At launch, we experienced critical errors with our network infrastructure. The result was high ping, matchmaking errors, crashes, and servers not appearing in the browser. Since launch, we've been working to address the issues and increase network stability. We will continue our efforts until our network infrastructure is stabilized to prevent further out outages. Uh, and then please continue to report bugs via their actual page, okay? But that's not the only thing that's been going on. So this just mainly focuses on the online stuff, which is what a lot of people were buying this game for because they wanted to play Battlefront 1 and specifically Battlefront 2 online with everybody on current consoles. That's PS5, uh, was it Nintendo Switch, Xbox Series X and S, as well as also on PC. So that's not the only problem though. There's been a number, okay, a number of different issues, okay, that have popped up with the Battlefront collection, okay? So obviously this is a story here from IGN. I'm actually going to go click on it right now. Sorry from IGN. They've been writing about it saying that it's been a disastrous launch. And I kind of disagree with that to an extent because the launch of the game wasn't a full disaster. Okay. You could still play the game offline. No problem. All the different modes, all the different features that they mentioned, especially for the offline modes has been great. Okay. I played both Battlefront 1 and 2. I could tell you right now, the game works fine. It's still just as fun as you remember. The main issue, though, and what everybody's focusing on is the online components. And that's what we got to be fair about. Because as far as the launch of the online servers, yes, it is a mess right now. I played a bunch of matches. Okay, I at least tried to get into a bunch of matches. And I did get into some. I did enjoy what I played, even though it was still kind of like, you know, glitchy. There was a lot of lag and stuff. But still launch things were all over the place and i feel like that'll get better over time 
But to say that the complete package of a launch was a mess, I think is kind of inaccurate and a little hyperbolic. This is the other thing, too, that I do have to mention because I saw this pop up earlier this morning about the mod thing. We talked about this a few times where there was apparently a mod from the PC version of Battlefront 2 with Asajj Ventress that was, you know, put into the game. This shipped out with the launch version of the game on PlayStation 5, apparently, and the update changed that up. So... There's been a lot of back and forth with this, you know, the original creator of the mod having an opinion about this stuff, which I understand it could be a little bit annoying, but outside of that, there's been a lot of chatter about this game, and it sucks to see because not all of it is positive. There's a lot of legit reasons why there's a lot of negative discourse about this. I really do hope, and fingers crossed, that Aspire could actually remedy a lot of these problems. They should have been much more better prepared for the launch of this game. It really is a little bit baffling to me that you only have really three servers that are dedicated to 64 players that you pretty much put in your advertisements in your trailer. That was like one of the big selling points of this game. The other thing too, which I think is a little bit annoying, a lot of the bugs and glitches I'm seeing across different platforms feels like it should have been ironed out a little bit better. I saw a couple like, you know, texture problems, which I didn't experience in my own game, but I saw other people sharing on different social media, specifically from the PC version and also from the Nintendo Switch version. But funny enough, I also saw a few people talking about how the Nintendo Switch version and the Xbox version uh, haven't been having as many issues compared to the other two platforms, which again, it's, it's kind of baffling to me with everything that's going on. But regardless though, I really do hope that they remedy this and they correct this because people love Battlefront. I love Battlefront. We wanted to play this game for a long time and it's, it's kind of a shame because it feels like a little bit that Aspire can't catch a break, especially with Star Wars stuff between everything going on with Knights of the Old Republic remake and all the stuff that they were working on, some of the previous Star Wars games that have been hit or miss for some people. It's just been not the best of times for them. But regardless, though, tell me your thoughts about Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection down below in the comments. Have you picked it up on any platform, PS5, PC, Nintendo Switch, wherever have you? And what do you think about all the issues that the game has been experiencing right now? Do you think they're going to fix up all these online issues or not? Tell me about that down below in the comment section. So that was, to me, probably the biggest release you know, as of late, you know, more recently within the last few days. But that wasn't the only release that came out that we, of course, have to talk about the big one. The big one that came out recently before Battlefront Classic Collection. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Now, here are my post thoughts about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, okay? Because I finished the game not that long ago. I want to say at the time of when I actually got Battlefront Classic Collection, I want to say about it was a day or two prior that I finally finished the main story of the game. Now, I am going back and doing some of the side quests, doing all the extra, like, exploration stuff, but I finished the main story. That was the big thing for me that I wanted to do. And overall, okay, I'm looking at uh, the, the Metacritic for the game. A lot of hundreds, a lot of high scores, a lot of people praising the game for many different reasons. So here's my overall opinion, post-game thoughts about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. The game is fantastic. The game is awesome. It was fun to play through. It has its little issues here and there. I will admit, I played the game on normal. There's a couple points later on in the story that I think are way too difficult for normal difficulty. I think that there's a couple sections that also drag on a little bit too much or at least stretched out a little bit too much in certain sections. Granted, they're trying to be faithful to a lot of the original scenes from the original game. And there's a couple other spots where they try to expand upon some of the scenes from the original Final Fantasy VII. But as a package, as a complete experience, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, to me anyway, is one of those must-own experiences on the PlayStation 5. I feel like if you own a PS5 and you love action RPGs or you love Final Fantasy or you love JRPGs in general, you have to own Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's big as far as the amount of places you could go to, the exploration, the scope of stuff that you could go, kind of roam around in, the amount of content to do, all the different activities between all the map stuff that you could find, all the different side quests, the main quests, of course, the mini games, you got Queen's Blood, which funny enough, right? <clears throat> Queen's Blood is surprisingly addictive, which is kind of goofy, to be honest with you. I did not expect to get into it as much as I did. I always thought like I was going to ignore it, but once I started playing it, I just kept on playing it in different sections and just trying to beat all the different people to level up in Queen's, uh, my rank in Queen's Blood. And I just went from there. And surprisingly, it was pretty good. The other thing, too, they have that other mini game from Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is the one where you actually have the little chibi kind of like, a, what is it, real-time strategy games? Oh, my God. And I, I'm blanking on the name right now. But there's a side quest that's tied to it. Okay? it's I think it's Four Condor. 
okay? It's this little kind of like, you know, real-time strategy minigame where you place units on a map and you have to take out the enemy's tower. There's a whole side quest devoted to that, that, which funny enough, I did not expect to be in the game again. I know that was a big part of the side quest in Final Fantasy VII Remake, but they brought it back again here. And again, surprisingly addictive. I was like, I'm not going to do the rest of this, but I did the whole quest. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I will go back and finish the hard mode of that. That is actually kind of cool. So again, the game is just a joy to play through. It's just actually surprisingly fun. And I did, again, I knew that this game was going to be good because I love Final Fantasy VII Remake. I thought that was an amazing experience. Arguably one of the best games of the year that it came out. And this one for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I think is going to be in the game of the year conversation for 2024. A lot of people want to have different opinions. A lot of people are going to come out and say, it's like, oh, it's too early. Maybe you're just a little bit on the high of like just finishing the game. You know, it's, there's not much different about this from remake or remake looked a little bit better. I don't care about any of that. Okay. I'm focusing on the overall experience that I had by the time I finished it. And I will tell you, I really enjoyed this game. I think that it's a lot of fun to play through. I think that even if you're not a big final fantasy seven fan and you're kind of coming into this with fresh eyes, the game does a great job of catching you up from what happened in remake, but also just gets you into the world as far as, you know, really seeing the best aspects of final fantasy seven and just Midgar. And, and Gaia in general, even if you're not into all of the lore that came beforehand with the original game or all the other spin-offs, even if you didn't play Crisis Core, I feel like you'll enjoy Final Fantasy VII Rebirth because I know Crisis Core is that prequel. It's that side game that some people love, okay, or at least a lot of people love, I should say, but not everybody has played, even though it came out again, the reunion version on PlayStation 5. But the point is, though, Rebirth is that game right now. It is doing really well for a lot of people. It's again, as we saw here with the the Metacritic, is getting a lot of high scores. Look at these, all these in the 90s. There was a bunch of hundreds up above. There are very few low scores for this game. Like I'm scrolling down, that now finally gets to the 80s. There's nothing below an 80, which is great. And funny enough, some of these other outlets haven't really been scoring it. Like Otaku Polygon, The Verge, CNET, AV Club, they haven't given it a score. But look at Look at all these like high scores in the hundreds, the nineties. Look at this. this is pretty. This is pretty wild, man. This is pretty wild, and it's to me, it's well deserved. I think Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is really a great game on PS5. But those are just my uh, post game thoughts about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Tell me your thoughts about it down below in the comment section. Have you picked it up for PlayStation Five? Are you going to anytime soon? What do you think is going to happen in the next game? Because we are going to get a third game. I don't know if it's going to be the last game with these whole like remake, rebirth, whatever. I think that the next game should be called Final Fantasy VII Reunion. Personally, I think that's kind of the direction they're going. But whatever's going to go down in that game, I think that based on the ending and some of the wild territory that they start to step into with the story and the plot, I feel like this game is going to, the next game is going to be a big blowout. We, we might not see that for a while though. I give it a couple years before we see Final Fantasy VII part three <laughs> whatever it's gonna be called i think it should be called reunion but that's just me so tell me your thoughts about all that down below in the comment section so finally let's get into the final big topic which is the one that everybody has been talking about lately especially if you've been on social media okay with everything that's gone on with tiktok okay so tiktok has been facing some pretty pretty serious stuff okay from the government you know, from a lot of other world governments. There's uh, right now that they just passed a bill in the House of Representatives, and now it's going to go get voted on the Senate before it reaches the president uh, about the ban on TikTok, which some people have said it's a full flat out ban. That's not necessarily true. It's like this ban with conditions or conditions to a ban almost with TikTok. Basically, the U.S. government doesn't want the company, I think it's ByteDance, I believe that's the main parent company of TikTok right now, but the company that owns TikTok, that has a majority stake in it, they, yeah, it's called ByteDance. They they have a Chinese owner, okay? Or at least there's there's a they're a Chinese owner for that actual uh, social media app for TikTok. And the U.S. government is worried about TikTok actually being playing some sort of part in like actually giving information to the CCP, okay? Which is the Chinese Communist Party. There's a lot of other political stuff that gets into it. I'm not going to get into that right now, but it's very complex overall. But how it relates to TikTok is that people are worried that they're going to be giving information from U.S. citizens and people that use TikTok, the app, to the Chinese government. And that's a problem. So they voted on actually getting this bill, okay, passed in the House of Representatives, which it did. Now it's going to go to the Senate. So the conditions of this bill, 
okay, and why it might lead to a ban on TikTok, or at least there's potential to lead to a ban uh, of TikTok, is because the U.S. government wants that company to sell its majority stake to another company, preferably U.S. owned. So some sort of entity that doesn't have any sort of ties to the CCP. Now, what would happen if this ban goes into effect? What would happen if they don't go past that, what is it, 160, 180 days after this thing passes with all the different branches of government? Basically, there will be a massive ban on TikTok and a lot of people potentially will lose an outlet for their businesses. This means a lot of content creators will be out of TikTok pretty much. They won't be able to promote themselves on TikTok. A lot of businesses that sell stuff off of TikTok would lose that branch of their actual business. There could be potentially a lot of people, especially the who, those who are working on TikTok, that are affected by all this stuff going on. I think, what was the number? It's like over 100,000, some ridiculous number of people that, that have their businesses tied to TikTok in general. But really, for how it relates to us and relates to someone like me, that is someone that does uh, post on TikTok, um, it actually would affect me because I would actually lose this brand of my, my, this arm of my actual brand, like this outlet where I put up videos, because you guys know I post up on TikTok literally every day. I'm talking about games. I'm talking about movies and everything else, pop culture. So if this ban goes into effect, I will lose out on all that. However, there's a couple caveats to this. Okay. For both people like me and many others out there that have multiple social media outlets, TikTok for me is not the end all be all platform. I would say that my bread and butter and my first like, you know, go to platform would be YouTube, which is how you're watching this podcast now. Or you're, if you're watching this elsewhere, it would really be YouTube as like my main platform, you know, and then TikTok is comes right after that. It's my second biggest platform where I post up content. So if something happens to TikTok, I still have an outlet to at least post up all my stuff. YouTube, I could do YouTube shorts. I could post stuff up on Instagram reels. You know, I have threads as well to Twitter. The list goes on. So luckily for me, even though I would still like TikTok to be okay, I don't want anything to happen to TikTok where it gets banned, I would still have options to go to in order to post up my content and still be out there with a lot of stuff that I talk about. And the same thing happens for a lot of other larger creators. If they were smart about their content and about their brand, they wouldn't just rely solely on TikTok. But it does affect those that have a massive following on TikTok. Again, there's a lot of people that would be affected by this where it's like, you know, some of the larger channels on TikTok. So we got people like Straw Hat Goofy, people like, uh, what is it? King Lion, I've seen some of his stuff. Uh, Ares, who's also on Comic Talk. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, just thinking randomly like that. Um, a lot of the different businesses, like the different shows that have TikTok pages that you follow, like the 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 Daily Show, um, HBO Max, um, Netflix also has one as well. Everybody out there that has larger channels. And then again, larger creators that strictly do stuff on TikTok, they have a lot to worry about. And again, if they were smart, they would have multiple platforms. So everybody would be affected if you're into social media, if you're into content creation in some way, if you've had a TikTok. Do I think that TikTok itself in general, is there really going to be that bit, that actual thing happen where the, the actual platform gets banned? The reason why I say no in this, okay? I don't believe that it would actually reach the point within that 160 days or so where the platform would actually be fully banned here in the United States or in North America is because I feel like there's enough, um, uh, was it smart-minded people over at TikTok, you know, the owner of TikTok, the actual CEO, and a bunch of other people that I feel like would actually do enough stuff or at least find a way to make things work or sell off the company before it even gets to that point. I still feel like, you know, there's a lot of people that would make a big enough noise to pressure them to sell off or to make whatever moves that they need to make before TikTok officially gets banned in the United, in the United States. I, I don't think it's going to get to that point. I think the threat about that is enough to scare everybody, you know, in, in some way, okay? Because obviously TikTok had the thing with messages, trying to reach out to everybody to call their representatives, which clearly did not work, <laughs> clearly did not work. Like, obviously... If you go look at some of the other articles that have been passed around, they do talk a little bit about how TikTok really tried to get their audience to like, you know, not really harass, but just like annoy a lot of the state representatives, which clearly did not work. It, it, they, there was no effect from that, right? But that being the case, now that we've passed this point where it passed in the House of Representatives, now it's going to the Senate. I feel like maybe by the time, if it does get approved by the Senate, which a lot of people did say it is, but before it gets to the president's hands, I feel like, or at least, you know, right after it gets to the president's hands in some way, if, at the latest, maybe, I feel like stuff will happen enough with TikTok to actually sell their company and make the moves that they need to make before it actually gets outright banned. 
Okay. At least that's how I foresee it because I don't think that they'll allow it to get to that point. I really don't think that, you know, TikTok is going to be that bold enough or at least going to play chicken enough with the government, let alone, right? To actually get to that point where their app gets banned in the United States because there are other countries that have banned TikTok. Like, let's be real. I've seen a couple of people talk about this, that there's other third world countries outside of the US and outside of North America that have banned TikTok that has nothing to do with China, has nothing to do with the United States or, or Russia, I believe it is, or whoever else, okay? There are other third world countries that have done this. But with the United States specifically, why the ban would actually be such a big deal is because it's one of the biggest markets and one of the biggest places for people that use social media. There's others out there, don't get me wrong. But obviously, there's a lot of business, there's a lot of money that's involved with doing business and having an app that's used by a lot of people here in the United States. So I think that's why, you know, things won't get to that point. That's why I think it's the biggest motivating factor to get this all stuff like, you know, figured out in some way before it gets to that point. But that's just my opinion on the matter. That's at least how I look at it. Again, I think it sucks that we've gone to this point, but I don't think it's going to get to the point where things are going to get really dire, at least for TikTok. For me, like I said, I have all the other platforms. I have all the other spots where I could post up content before anything happens or if something happens, I feel like I'll still be good. I'll still at least be putting out content out here for you guys to check out because I have all these options available to me. And the same thing for other people, like I mentioned. But like I said, that's my opinion on the matter. Let me know some of your thoughts about this down below in the comment section. Do you think that TikTok is going to get banned here in the US? Do you think that this is going to be a very, very big deal? Do you think it'll get to that point where TikTok will be banned here in the US? Tell me your thoughts about that down below in the comment section. So that's all I got for this podcast. That was a lot to dive into. There was many different things that, you know, we had to discuss. I went through all my, my different topics here because there was just so much that happened. And there's still other stuff I didn't touch on. Let me put it this way, okay? There are other things that I know that are going on right now that I've been watching. I've been actually waiting to see what happens and, and really kind of just simmer on my thoughts. But let alone, let me make sh- let you guys know, uh, I am paying attention to all the stuff that's going on, especially in the games industry. If you know, if you know, you know, okay, because it's already out there. I'm already paying attention to all that stuff, but at the current moment, I have nothing to say on it. I, I just want to see what happens because there's been a lot of messes all over the place. Again, there's been a lot that's been happening over the last couple of weeks, but there's already so much to get into. There's already so much to talk about with games, with movies, with pop culture, social media. Like I said, it's just been wild the last like few weeks, but either way, I'm still finding out and, and, and getting informed and seeing what's going on with everything else in the world right now, especially online on social media. But anyway, that's all I got for you guys on this episode of the podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion and all the thoughts that I shared. Like I said before, make sure you leave a like on this video on this episode of the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more episodes like this and all the other gameplay videos. There's a lot of stuff that's been going on. I have two videos up now about the Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection. There's going to be more coming soon, maybe later today, if not tomorrow. I'm probably going to try to see if I could do some online stuff, granted, if the servers are working. Or, if anything, I might just do a video and just show you guys just how bad the servers could get online on PlayStation 5. But we'll make sure that happens. There's other indie games I've been playing as well on the channel that you guys could definitely check out. That There's a lot. There's, a, what is it, Orion Haste that I did recently and a few others that you definitely should check out when you can. Um, like I said, follow me on TikTok while the app is still around. There's videos I've been posting up every single day, multiple videos about gaming, movies, etc. over on TikTok. I've been posting up all the time. Don't forget to follow me on my other social media, Twitter at Jake James Lugo, Instagram at Jake James Lugo. Follow me on threads at Jake James Lugo. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I've shared on all those platforms that I know you all will love. So anyway, that's all I got for you guys. I will talk to all of you again very soon. Peace out and stay epic, everybody. This channel is sponsored by Flynn's Arcade and More, located in Margate, Florida. Flynn's is one of the premier spots for gaming fans in South Florida. They have a variety of arcade games on cabinet for you to play throughout the week, including all of your beloved classics. You could also play a ton of new and current console games too, on PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo consoles. Grab a snack or drink and enjoy the best gaming experience you'll find. Visit during one of their many big events to connect with the gaming community in South Florida. Want to test your skills in competitive fighting games? Join any of the weekly tournaments that happen at Flynn's for a chance for some cool prizes. And if you're into tabletop gaming or model kit building, there's a bunch of events there for you too. Swing by Flynn's Arcade and More, located in Margate Boulevard in Margate, Florida. You won't find a better spot than Flynn's.